Okay, so um, thanks again for the invitation. And yeah, as you know, this is my second set of talks here. And this will also be about the Kunsen group, but about different aspects of it. And so in particular, I will assume that you remember some things. You have just one Sanchez, because I think the people... Uh, um, yes. You want to speak a little bit louder. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think the mic is still muted. Is it muted? Screen. It's screen. Oh, no, it's only that this device is very soft. I think. It, it might be. It might be. I'll speak harder. Just mute that for now. Let me know if, if you don't hear me or something. And I... Okay. Well, this is normal. Okay. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, okay, do you want to try again? Okay, hello? Uh, okay, give me one second. I'll be okay. right back. I don't know if it's my laptop. You might have gone. Maybe. Higher? Yeah, higher, maybe. Let's see. Here, maybe? It might be too high. <laughs> yeah, now, now we. Yeah? yeah? That's it, yeah? Okay. Okay, well, then let me start again. Um, so yeah, um, so this is the second set of talks. Yeah, It's also going to be about the Kunsen group, but different aspects of it. And so I, I'm going to assume that you remember the basic definitions from two weeks ago, but that just, for this talk, the definition of the Kunsen group, and that's it. And for the second talk, the definition of what an abstract Kunsen group is. But for the second talk, I can stay here and, and recall what all these notions are. And so, well, this, this first talk, which is based on joint work with Hannes Steele, is about the global gleam problem, which is an open problem that, that appears very naturally when you study regularity properties for possibly non-simple sister algebras. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me write three questions that seem unrelated, but which actually share something in common. So let's say that A is a sister algebra, and well, this is the first and last time that I write this. So throughout the talk, A will always be a sister algebra. Then one, can, one could ask, for example, if, oops, if the nuclear dimension of A is finite, is A that stable? Of course, this is a question that has a positive or a negative answer, depending on the sister algebra that you are studying. Now, second question is, is the rank map, as defined two weeks ago, surjective? Again, I'm not going to use this, so if you don't know what this is, that's fine. And then third question, if A is weakly purely infinite, which I will now define, Yes. It's the, the rank of X, so it takes, okay. but this will not be needed. It's just motivation. Um, so if A is weakly purely infinite, is A purely infinite? So recall that what these two words mean in the possibly non-simple setting is the following. So this is due to Kirchberg Rordam. So one says that A is purely infinite. If X is two times X for each X in the Kunsen group. Usually, this definition is given only by elements in A, not in A tensor K, but you can see that this property passes to stabilizations. So it's the same definition. And then A is weakly purely infinite. If there exists some global 
constant a natural number such that and then let me write it here n times x is two times n times x for each x in c u so clearly any purely infinite system algebra would be purely infinite just by taking n to be one but the converse is not known and and this question has been open for 21 years now. So we don't know if weakly purely infinite system algebras are purely infinite. Okay. So, well, as you can see, these are all questions about regularity properties in, in a presumably non simple setting. And, well, you could ask, what do all these questions have in common? And the answer is that if you hope to get a positive answer for any of these questions, you must assume that the system algebra is sufficiently non-commutative. So what does that mean? Well, for example, let's say that your system algebra is commutative. Then none of these questions have a positive answer, right? Because say that you have an Abelian system algebra with finite dimensional spectrum, then its nuclear dimension is finite, but of course this is never that stable. And similarly, depending on, on how versed you are with the Kunzen group, you can see that the rank map is never going to be subjective if the system algebra is commutative. And no commutative system algebra is weakly purely infinite. So that third question doesn't even make sense in this setting. And so it's not just that your system algebra cannot be commutative, but because the things that we are trying to deduce pass to ideals and quotients, no non-zero ideal of a quotient can be commutative. For example, if such a system algebra was that stable, you'd get a contradiction because almost divisibility passes to ideals and quotients, and then you'd get that the commutative system algebra is almost divisible, which is not the case. Um, similarly, you can also show that no such system algebra has a subjective rank map. And again, those sort of system algebras are not weakly purely infinite. And so the third question still doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is just to motivate that if you are studying regularity properties outside the simple setting, you must ensure some sort of, some sort of non-commutativity. Okay, so that's, um, let's say, if one hopes to get a positive answer, not just to these questions, but many others, um, let's say that one must ensure sufficient non-commutativity yes. so <clears throat> now what do I mean by this of course you could just take as a definition that no ideal of a quotient is commutative other than zero but by studying these properties you can see that something slightly stronger is satisfied which is that no non-zero ideal of a quotient is elementary, meaning that it's not isomorphic to K of H for any Hilbert space H. So this is the first definition, which is no way scattered. So system algebra A is no way scattered if no non-zero ideal of a quotient is elementary. Okay. You can see that unless the sister algebra satisfies this property, you are not getting a positive answer out of any of those questions. And so that's the first property. It's something that naturally appears when you try to answer these sort of things. And I will explain in a couple of minutes where this the terminology comes from. Um, H might be finite dimensional, so just yeah. So this is the first of two notions that ensure sufficient non-commutativity and that appears naturally in this in these sort of settings. There is another notion which looks not as clear as this one, let's say, but it's actually more useful, 
and that's what the global green property is. So this is the definition due to Kirchner and Rodan. <laughs> so well it's a has the global green property and of course the problem will be related to this if for any choice of positive element A and any positive epsilon, there exists some star homomorphism, let's say phi, um, let me write this down here, phi from the two by two matrices from C0, 0, 1 to the hereditary subsystem algebra of A, such that The image of this map is almost full, meaning that it contains the epsilon cut-down of A. So such that the epsilon cut-down of A is in the ideal generated by the image of phi. Okay. So you can prove that that this also ensures what I meant by sufficient non-commutativity. And as you can see, it's as I said, uh, maybe a more technical condition, but it's it's the more useful one. So let me remark a couple of things. The first thing is that the global green problem, sorry, the global green property always implies no West Catalyst. So one is stronger than the other. And well, I forgot to mention, I, I don't know the exact reason, but I assume that this is called the global Green property because there is a famous result due to Glim that says that no, that every system algebra that's not type one has a non-zero square zero element. So in particular, in the simple case, what the result is saying is that the system algebra has a full square zero element. Right? And in some sense, these are, this is a localization of that. You are asking this, to approximately happen in every hereditary subsystem. Okay, so that's why this is called the global clean property. I have forgotten what your capital I is. Oh, just the ideal generated. Okay, inside the hereditary subarray. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So you get the ideal generated by the image of phi, inside here and then um, well this is what you ask so you want the the countdown of a to to be there but you wouldn't expect it to be just in the um, the, the, uh, the image of the... no not not usually no not usually in fact that that has huge implications i mean the number of 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 let's say elements here that you may need to write this as a sum, yeah. that's actually a constant that's important. Not for this talk, but for yeah. other applications. For instance, if you want to see that this sort of thing passes to ultra products, you need to study the number of elements. Okay. Okay. But for this talk, I'm just assuming that that number is unbounded. So we just the idea generated. Okay, so um, now the global clean property implies no West Catanes. So let me give you a bunch of examples where the global clean property is satisfied. Um, first example just follows from the result that I mentioned by Klim, which is that simple non-elementary C algebras have the global clean property. And so in particular, they are nowhere scattered. Then just as another example, um, set stable system algebras 
also have the global green property. Um, this might not be obvious directly, but I will give ways of seeing this during the talk. Okay, so now I said that these two properties appear naturally when you study this sort of, of, of conditions in possibly non-simple system algebras, but I, I didn't really say how they appear. And it turns out that they always appear together and always in the form of a question. Namely, the question is always if you can reverse this, this implication. So the question, which is the global clean problem, is if these two things are equivalent. So the global clean problem does every no scattered system algebra Uh, the global green property. So that's the question. And the the origins of this really is in, in the study done by Kirchberg and Rordam on purely infinite and weakly purely infinite cisnatures. Because they realize that if this has a positive solution in the class of weakly purely infinite sister algebras, then every weakly purely infinite sister algebra is purely infinite. So that would solve that third question. So let me just say that every weakly purely infinite sister algebra is nowhere scattered. So this you can show. Generally, traceless system algebras are all now scattered. And what they showed, among many other things, is that a weakly purely infinite This algebra is purely infinite even if it has the global green property. That's in some sense where the problem appeared, at least implicitly. Okay, so that's the problem. And as, as I said in the beginning, the point is to at some, some stage translate all this to the Kunzen group and, and try to say some things. But go ahead. Just wondering how you get this last second last statement. If so, is it true for purely, weakly purely infinite that every ideal and every quotient has the same property? Yes. Okay. Yes. But then, um, then it's pretty clear. Then it's pretty clear that uh, it has to be no worse guy. Yes. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I just meant that. I mean. But sure. No. I, I'm not yeah. suggesting you shouldn't say it. No. 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 Yeah. Of course. Um. But I mean, this is as I said. If you assume that your sister algebra is traceless, then essentially by the same reason, then you can see that it's no worse scattered. Okay. Okay. If it's traceless. Oh. Yeah. For the same reason, because if if you assume that it's traceless and you assume that it has a, an elementary ideal quotient, then you can just lift everything back to the sister algebra, yeah. and you get a, a non-trivial trace. So, okay. So now, <clears throat> let me first take a quick detour and, and explain why no scattered sister algebras are called no scattered. So this is let's say section one. No scatteredness. And so, as you may have guessed, um, this name uh, is named this way because there is a notion of scatteredness for sister algebras. And no scatteredness will be the complete opposite of scatteredness. And so, to define what scatteredness means for sister algebras, 
let me first define what it means for topological spaces, which is really where the definition came from. So a topological space X is said to be scattered. And, and this goes back to at least Kuratowski, but before that as well, I think. So X is scattered if every non-empty flow subset has an isolated point. In, in the topology induced by the subset, that's what I mean. So this, as I said, it's a very classical definition. It's, it's been studied extensively, in particular in the compact metric case, which at, at the very end is what we are interested in. And this definition was taken and translated to the setting of sister algebras. And so Jensen was the one to, to give the definition, but the definition that I'm going to give is actually a, a theorem by Gazami and Cosmaida. So this is Jensen, but the definition is an equivalent characterization by Gazami Kosmaidar, which essentially says that to define scatterness, you can just take this definition and translate it directly. And you'll get your notion of scatterness. So the definition is that a system algebra is scattered If, now I have to translate this part, this is just that every non-zero quotient has, and now I have to translate having an isolated point. And if you think about commutative sister algebras, the translation of that is a projection Let's say a non zero projection P in that quotient. So every non zero quotient A mod I, where I is always to be, is always going to be um, close and two sided. So a projection here such that the corner is minimal. So if you think in the commutative case, then really, if you have an isolated point, say, then the indicator function at that point is a continuous function because the point is isolated and it's a projection. And it satisfies precisely this, that the corner is minimal. And conversely, if you have a commutative system algebra and you, you assume that you have such a projection, you can see that the support is the support of an isolated point. Okay. So that's, that's the precise translation of being scattered in the system algebra set. Okay. And as in the case of topological spaces, these this system algebras have also been studied extensively and many of the characterizations that can be obtained for scattered spaces translate to characterizations of system algebras. For example, um, this is the same as saying that every subsystem algebra has real rank zero. So, well, the, the talk is really not about this, it's about no scatterness. And so the whole point of introducing this is to be able to write the following, which is that A being no scattered, is the same thing as saying that A has no non-zero, or rather that let me put it another way. So no non-zero quotient A mod Y of A contains a projection of that kind. So a non-zero projection P such that P and YP is CP. 
Now, if we were in the von Neumann case or the real rank zero case, we would just say that it has no minimal projection. But for general system algebra, these two things are not the same. Right? So any such projection is minimal, but there are minimal projections that don't satisfy this. Okay, so that's the reason why it's called no way scattered, right? Because it's not just saying that there is some quotient that doesn't contain such a projection, but it's saying that no quotient has this property. And so just to add another characterization, um, this is the same as saying that no hereditary subsistence algebra has one dimensional or finite dimensional irreducible representations. So, I mean, by this, I don't mean that, that one dimensional or finite dimensional are the same. I just mean that there are two statements here. So being nowhere scattered is the same thing as no hereditary subsistence algebra has one dimensional irreducible representations. And that's the same thing as no hereditary subsistence algebra has finite dimensional irreducible representations. Okay, that's what I mean. Okay. So now these are nowhere scattered system algebras and they I didn't mention this, but they are very well behaved in the sense that they have nice permanence properties and so on. So there, there is a way of building them um, by basic blocks. And I just wanted to finish this section by giving a, an extra characterization of nowhere scatteredness that really shows the relation between the global gleam property and nowhere scatteredness. And in some sense, it, it shows why these two things might be equivalent, or at the very least, why this is an open problem and not just some random question. something here. So now this is the characterization again that shows the, the relation between both things and it's as follows. So A is nowhere scattered even on leave and now for any positive A and any positive epsilon there exist finally many maps phi one to phi n from the two by two matrices C0, zero, zero, 1 to the hereditary subsystem algebra of A such that add down of A is in the ideal generated by the combined images of the star homomorphisms. So as you can see, really the difference is that here, presumably, you have no control over this n. This n might depend on both a and epsilon. Okay. So the question really, the global green problem, what it's asking is if you can somehow combine these maps into one. So the global green problem is, and we always said, And to be one for any A and epsilon. Oops. 
right? That's the difference between this and this statement. So it, it, it turns out to be, um, well, at least in spring, these are called optimization programs, but in, in the undergrad sense. So you are told that a certain task can be performed by finally many things, and you are asked if you can actually do them with a single thing. So that's precisely what this is saying. Right? These star homomorphisms are doing something, in this case, containing this. And the question is, well, first of all, can you bound this for any A and epsilon? And if you can bound this, can, they, can you then prove that the bound can be um, reduced to one? So this, this is a sort of problem that, that, that appears also very frequently in operator algebras and in mathematics in general. For instance, for operator algebras, this has the same flavor as asking if every finally generated for Neumann algebra is singly generated. Of course, I mean, the two problems are completely unrelated and I'm not saying that there is a relation. I, all I'm saying is that it's the same sort of flavor. And the same thing goes for the nuclear dimension of classifiable sister algebras, right? A classifiable sister algebra of finite nuclear dimension has nuclear dimension at most one. So it's always the same sort of process. If you can take finally many things and reduce them to one, that's the basic idea. Okay. I'm going to risk it and give the definition of the quantum loop for the people that were not here. So this is section two, and it's going to be about divisibility properties. Of the quantum loop. And well, very quickly, the definition of the quantum loop with just this, so how do I write this quickly? So even a v in a plus right a is super equivalent to be if a is the limit on n r n b r n star for some r n n and also write a equivalent to be if a is equivalent to be a is equivalent to a right um so those of you who were here this is just um and then with this define one center of a to be All the positive elements in the stabilization of A modded by this equivalent solution. If you will, and you're unfamiliar with this, you can just think that this is a version of the Murray von Neumann semigroup that uses positive elements instead of projections. That's the that's the gist of this. Right? And then you equip this. With The diagonal addition, um, just like in the more refundament semi rule. And to give it an order, which is the one induced by the. So, okay. This is just all very quickly, so that at least you have the definitions. And I promise not to erase this board. So I will leave this here for the remaining of the talk. Um, usually something that you also write is this, and by definition, this is that, that there exists some epsilon such that A is super equivalent not to B, but to a cut down of B. So it's, it's really vivo. So this is known as compact container. So I will leave this here. And you can just look at it whenever you need it. Um, 
And so now it turns out that these properties, so um, no scatterness, the global green property, and so on, can all be characterized by what's called the visibility properties of the Kunzel group. So what do I mean by this? Well, the Kunzel group, as you know, it's, it's a monoid. And when you only have a monoid and no, no additional structure, there is only one right notion of divisibility. But when you have a Kunzel group, which has more structure, in particular, it has an order and it has this compact containing relation, then you can start weakening the notion of divisibility. Okay. So now what I'm going to be doing is to write four notions of divisibility, and each one will be weaker than the previous one. Okay. So let's just say divisibility actual divisibility. So this would mean that for every or for any element in the Kunzel group and any natural number, you can divide x by k. So there exists y c of a such that x is k times y. Right? In other words, that y is x over k. So if you only had addition, that's really the only natural notion of divisibility that you can have. But this rarely happens in the Kuhn semigroup. For instance, it happens with the jason rasak algebra, because it's Kuhn semigroup, if you remember, is the um, non-negative extended real line, and that thing has actual divisibility. You can divide the elements because they are real numbers. Right? So, example, this, just this, and in here, of course, because you have real numbers, you divide x. Now, as I said, this, this happens only rarely. And so you can start weakening it by using this compact containment relation. And so the first important weakening is almost divisibility, which was introduced by Pinta. Now, as I said, in order to weaken this, we introduce a cut down. And so you say that a Kunze group or a sister algebra is almost divisible if for any x prime compactly contained in x in C of a. And by this, I just mean for any x prime x in C of a such that x prime is compactly contained in x and k in n that exists. Some element y, c of a, such that you can almost do this. That's where the name comes from. So, what can you do? Well, you can get k times y to be below x, but you are not getting k times y to be um, above x. So, instead, what you get is that x prime which is an approximation of x, if you will, it's a cut down, is k plus one times you know, y. Okay. So it's close to having actual divisibility, but it's slightly weaker. And this is satisfied for any sta z-stable system algebra. So if you have a z-stable system algebra, it's consumer has this property. But of course, if we want to characterize no scatteredness and the global green property, which both include the family of that stable system algebras, we need to weaken this further. And so, here. Now, the weakening will come by saying that we will have no control over the upper bound. So, now, these are notions due to Robert and Rordan. And the first one is called k omega divisibility. So what's this? Well, 
I start just like before. So for any x prime completely contained in x in C of A that exists, some y in C of A such that, and now as before, k times y is bounded by x. So this we do not lose, and the k is, is here. So k times y is zero x. But now the cut down of x is bounded by some multiple of y of which we have no control. And that's what the omega means here. So, and this for some natural number. Okay, so that's the weekend. Yeah. So this is k omega divisibility. The k is this k, and omega just means that you have no bound. Okay. So that n can be anything arbitrarily large. So can we weaken this further? And the answer is yes. And I promise that this is the, the last weakening. So the last weakening is called weak k omega divisibility. And now, as you'll see, it's a weakening of this directly. So for any x prime compactly contained in x in C of A, there exists, and now, well, I guess that you'll be able to guess the, the theorem that comes after. There exists a bunch of elements in C of A, such that k times yj is bounded by x for every j. And now x prime is bounded by the sum of all the elements. So the weakening here comes from saying, well, to go from this to this, you need to say that you cannot set all these to be the same. And these properties I should mention, so uh, Robert and Rodham introduced them by specific elements. So they'd say an element X is K omega divisible if this happens for every countdown. And the same thing for weak to omega divisibility. But it turns out that if you study Kuhn semigroups whose every element satisfies this property, which is the definition that I'm giving, then this characterizes. Yes. Yes, sorry, yes, yes. So, as I said, if you look at Kunsan groups whose every element satisfies one of those two properties, then you can actually characterize the West scatterness and the global clean property. Theorem. Um, a is now scattered. We can leave. One semigroup is weakly k omega divisible. Let's say equivalently. Um, if you assume that every element is k omega divisible, then you can show that this is the same as two omega divisibility. For a single element, this is not true. There are elements that are two omega divisible, but not three omega divisible. But if you assume the whole thing to satisfy the same property, then you can just pass to arbitrarily large um, divisions. So that's one thing. And then A has the global green property. If only if C 
C of A, I mess this up horrendously. I mean, as you might expect, this is weekly. And the other one is without the weekly. Yeah. So is um, two omega big zero. Equivalently, K omega big zero. So now, really, the, the, the global gleam problem is completely translated to something that's algebraic in nature. You are just asking if every weekly two omega divisible Kunzem group is two omega divisible. And the things that you can work with are an addition, uh, an order, and also the, the way below relation of the compact containment relation. It turns out, yes. No, no, go ahead. No. Okay, so you give an example of uh, the Pixar algebra that has uh, the PCP. Like you said that every single state of Pixar algebra is yes. not divisible. You have an example of all the Pixar algebra or the class of Pixar algebra that uh, are the omega divisible, like it's not almost divisible or with the omega divisible itself. Um, yeah, I mean, well, this I think one that's different between these two things I cannot give because that's the global gleam problem. Um, but then one that's let me think quickly, let's see if I can find at the ready. Um, well, I mean, if you take any simple non elementary sister algebra that's not that stable, okay. that will be nowhere scattered, but it will not be well, it could be almost divisible, but. Almost surely, it's not going to be almost divisible. Okay. So, okay. So now, how can we use this? Well, we can use this, let's say, algebraic framework to, to identify two conditions that capture precisely what's needed for weak two omega divisibility to imply two omega divisibility. So in other words, two properties of the Kunzem group such that when paired with no west cuttedness will give you the global green property. And it's an if and only if. So this is, I don't know, uh, section three. The global green problem. So I should have mentioned at the beginning that, um, so this problem has, of course, received um, some attention and it's been solved affirmatively for certain classes of sister algebras. For example, if you consider the class of real rank zero sister algebras, then it's, this is known to be true and it's due to Elliot and Rorda. And for stable rank one sister algebras, then this is also known to be true. And this is Antoine Pereira, Robert Cantillo in a recent paper. Okay. So now, what can one do? Well, as I said, you identify two conditions. And the first one is something that's called ideal filteredness, which essentially says that the intersection of two singly generated ideals should be singly generated, more or less. Okay. So, what I mean by this is this. So, C of A is ideal filtered. If whenever X prime is compactly contained in X, and this is um, in the ideal generated by two elements, let's say Y and Z, then you can find an element below Y and Z such that X prime is still in the ideal. So there exists. Um, S such that X prime less than M S or some N and S is less than Y. So just as an example, if the Kuhn semi group has infima, you can take the infimum of Y and Z. 
and that's your element s. So if x is less than a multiple of y and a multiple of z, it's also going to be less than a multiple of the infimum. And of course, the infimum is going to be below y. Okay, so that's an example. So example, if let's say these exist, you can just set this to be this infimum. And well, I mean, the paper by Antoine Pereira, Robert, and Till, where this problem is solved for stable rank one system algebras, what they really show is that you always have infimum. So, in particular, it follows from their results that any stable rank one system algebra, no way scattered or not, will have this property. Okay. Now, what's the point of this property? Well, um, let me actually put, the key, put this here. If A has the global green property, then the Kunsen group is ideal filtered. What about the converse? Well, if a nowhere scattered system algebra as an ideal filtered Kunsen group, then I just erase this, but the number of star homomorphisms needed is always going to be two or one. So we can bound the number and it's either two or one. So let me write this down. Oh, here. A is nowhere scattered. If A is nowhere scattered. And C of A is ideal filtered. Then well, the same thing as before. So for any A in A plus and positive epsilon, you can make do with two star homomorphisms. So there exist phi one, phi two, and two by two matrices of C0, zero, zero, 1. So the hereditary subsystem algebra of A such that, again, the same property holds. So the epsilon countdown of A is in the ideal generated with the image. Of these two maps. So you can reduce possibly unbounded by finite quantity to just two by adding this property. And of course, the question is, does every no west scattered sister algebra have an ideal filtered concept? And this we do not, but still, um, let me use two minutes and then we can go and get coffee. Um, the question, of course, is also, well, can you now fuse two star homomorphisms into one? And it's, it's not that clear. And what we had to do was add an extra property that I'm not going to define, but which we believe is satisfied automatically in any Kunze group. We don't have a proof. And so, um, Let me just say that this new property that I'm not going to uh, define directly is a very weak notion of having supreme. So the other is a very weak notion of having infima, and this one is a weak notion of having suprema. It's something called property V. 
And the point is that any system algebra with the global green property does satisfy this property. And if you assume this on top of that, then you get the global green property. So theorem. A having the global green property is the same thing as A being nowhere scattered and C of A being ideal filtered. And having property, which again, presumably, uh, this is always satisfied. So let me just say, um, without writing anything, the, maybe the merit of, of, of this result, the point is that there are many natural families of sister algebras where these two properties are satisfied regardless of assuming the sister algebra to be nowhere scattered not. So any real rank zero sister algebra, for example, again, without assuming nowhere scatteredness, will have these two properties. So automatically from this theorem, you add that nowhere scattered and the global green property are the same, which recovers the, the real rank zero case. And the same for stable rank one sister algebra. A stable rank one sister algebra, even if it's not nowhere scattered, it will still have an ideal filtered Kunsen group and it will also have property B. So then automatically you also get it. So presumably now the global green problem is just decomposed into two questions. The first one is to check if property B is automatic for any Kunsen group. And the second one is to check if no scatteredness implies ideal filteredness. And that's it. We do have examples of, of sister algebras that do not have an ideal filtered Kunsen group. So this is not automatic. And so in particular, let me just finish by saying that of course you can you could still apply this to weakly purely infinite system algebras. And we don't know, but presumably it's easier to start with the assumption of weakly purely infinite and try to check that these two things are satisfied. And if so, then it just follows from this theorem that every weakly purely infinite system algebra is purely infinite. So it, it would solve that. Okay. So well, that's that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>